Plura Cave Disaster It was the winter of February in 2014. Five cave divers had decided to explore a cave in Plurdalen. It was the Plura Cave, and the goal was to enter from the Plura entrance and exit the cave and exit the cave from the Stein Nugel Flagget, which was around 2,036 meters of total distance. The five divers were Kai Konkonen, a 46-year-old electrical contractor, Patrick Gronquist, a 42-year-old fireman, Yari Huo Taranen, a 40-year-old production manager, Vesa Rantanen, a 33-year-old electrical designer, and Yari Usimaki, a 34-year-old mechanical engineer. Kankanen had originally planned the trip for January, but had to reschedule it because many had prior commitments. Ultimately, it was by sheer coincidence that exactly these five men were there. And where this coincidence can take them, it was yet to come. It was minus three degrees Celsius outside on the morning of 6 February. The sun did not break above the fells until nine in the morning. There would be no more than seven hours of daylight, but the day would be bright. Gronquist and Hyo Tarinen have taken the task of cutting a hole in the ice with a chainsaw. There was snow aplenty everywhere. The northern sun shone low. The water was indeed remarkably clear in the hole that they were able to dig. The thick ice glimmered like turquoise crystal. The plan was simple. First team will start to make a hole at the Plura start site, while the second team will transport the change of clothes and gear to Stein Nugelflagen. The second team will then return to the plural start site and help the first team begin their dive. Hyoto Renin and Gronquist were preparing to take off below the ice as Usimaki and Kai Kankanen arrived. Vesa Rantanen had returned to the Jordbrew farm to fetch his dry suit. Usimaki peered into the hole at the black fins of Gronquist. The water's really clear, he said smiling. Patti and Yari Hyoto Renin about to take off towards Stein Nugel Flagget. They'll rest in water for a while. Gronquist and Huo Torinen proceeded toward the entrance to the cave. It was past midday on Thursday, 6 February. At a depth of 130 meters, Gronquist showed Huo Torinen the deepest point of the cave. From there, the passage began to ascend. At one point, it makes a 90 degree turn while continuing to ascend. Gronquist went first but having made it through, he realized the light of Huo Turinen was nowhere to be seen. He turned around and waited. Then Gronquist saw Yari waving his light up and down, indicating distress. Pate, come here, Huo Turinen screamed. Huo Turinen asked Gronquist to detach one of his large bailout cylinders. He swam back down the narrow passage to Huo Turinen and moved the bailout cylinder. Gronquist noticed that the line of his scooter was stuck under a big rock. Your scooter is stuck, shouted Gronquist. Yari tried to yank it free by force, and that was the end of that scooter. After the scooter came off, Gronquist moved out of the way. They were 111 meters below the surface. Huo Turinen was calling for Patrick Gronquist in the Plura Cave. Huo Turinen shouted, Give me the OC, the open circuit bailout gas. He handed him the mouthpiece from his cylinder. Yari took around 10 breaths and then switched back to the rebreather. It was repeated two or three times. After noticing that Huo Turinen had nothing in his mouth, Ronquist placed a diving regulator over his mouth and pressed the purge button. Huo Turinen inhaled water. It was all over. Ronquist grasped at a rock on the wall and tried to pull himself together. He realized that he was breathing fast, but had to calm down. His dive computer indicated that he had to remain in two degree water for seven hours before ascending safely to the surface to avoid fatal decompression sickness. Moments before the accident, the reading had been 120 minutes. How long had he stayed there? 15 minutes? 20 minutes? Every minute spent at a depth of 110 meters and pressure of 12 bars adds over 10 minutes to the duration of the dive. He could no longer swim back to tell the others what had happened. The way was also blocked. He was horrified and decided to swim towards Stein Nugel Flagget. He was thinking, what would have happened if Kankanen, Rantanen, will discover Huotarn's body in two hours' time? 
Ronquist was afraid they would all die. Unaware of the accident, Kankanen, Rontanen, and Usimaki began the dive. It was a little past two in the afternoon. It was agreed that the second team would depart two hours after the first one, in order to ensure that the sediment had settled. Rontanen went first, while Usimaki and Kankanen followed. At a depth of roughly 125 meters, Rontanen got stuck sliding through an opening less than one meter high. So Rontanen decided to take off two cylinders. Then one of his fins got tangled in the guideline. Take off my fin, he bellowed to the ones behind. Usimaki disentangled the fin. They descended to the deepest part of the cave and passed the round plastic plate attached to the guideline. Shortly thereafter, Rontanen heard a beep. It was the distress signal of a breathing apparatus, and moving forward he saw Huotaranen. He tried not to look and had to find a way around the body of Huotaranen, so he took off his gear to fit through. Usimaki saw Huotaranen. Kankanen tried to appease Uzimaki by pointing his light at the guideline. Usimaki yelled something, but it was not clear for Kankanen. Kankanen had yet to learn about the fate of Huotaranen, but Usimaki had already seen it and was swinging particularly and switched from the closed circuit system to his bailout system. Kankanen tried to calm Usimaki by talking to him. He made sure that Usimaki wasn't trapped and that the bailout gas was on. As the situation continued, Kankanen realized it couldn't be a failure in the rebreather. There was nothing he could do, and moments later, Usimaki was also dead. Kankanen realized he had to swim on. Then he saw the body of Huotaranen, and next to it, the fins of Rontanen. Kankanen shouted to Rontanen that Usimaki was also dead and that we should turn back. Rontanen dared not to turn back due to the way being longer. He thought Rontanen was unlikely to make it and presumed Gronquist had died. As Kankanen swam back toward the entrance, he weighed up his own chances of survival, determined that they were slim. He had two rebreathers, but only little additional oxygen. One of the bailout cylinders was suitable only for deeper parts of the cave and could not be used during the ascent. The first decompression stops would have to be made at a depth of roughly 100 meters. It should not be longer than one minute at such depths, but become longer as the ascent continues. He continued to ascend steadily, irrespective of his dive computing indicating that he had to stop for an additional hour to decompress. He estimated that he was more likely to run out of oxygen than to develop decompression sickness. After reaching the air chamber, he decided to breathe the air trapped inside to conserve his oxygen. He would have an unlimited supply of air should he decide to stay in the chamber, but how many days would he have to stay there? If the others were dead, there would be no one on the surface to alert the rescue workers. No one would know he was alive. Kankanen decided to move, but his underwater scooter broke down shortly thereafter. He got really afraid that he would run out of oxygen, but he kept the ascension on. Patrick Gronquist on the other end could not ascend to the surface for several hours. He had performed long decompression stops before, but never before in such cold water. Unknown to him, Vesa Rontanen was making his own decompression stops behind him. At the other end of the cave, Kai Kankanen performed his own decompression stops. It was terribly cold. The cold swept over him as soon as he stopped. Rontanen was constantly plagued by guilt for having been unable to help Usimaki. He wondered whether Gronquist had also died Hours passed. He opened the valve of his last oxygen cylinder. He thought of his spouse and three children waiting at home. None of them were no longer able to perform the necessary decompression stops. Gronquist thought if he could make it to six meters, he would be able to make it out. Then he saw light beneath him. Gronquist dives back into 12 meters and finds Rontanen. Rontanen told Gronquist that the others had turned back. This gave Gronquist strength, and he managed to make the stops nearly until the end. Gronquist rose to the surface a little past nine o'clock in the evening, half an hour before it was safe. Instead of five, this dive had lasted eight and a half hours. 
He sat down in the Steinnugel Flagate Cave to wait for Rontanen. Six meters below the surface, Rontanen saw the light from the headlamp of Gronquist as he sat in the cave waiting for him. At the depth of three meters, his arms began to ache, a sign of decompression sickness, he presumed. Gronquist had waited for Rontanen for an hour when he ascended to the surface, nearly 90 minutes before it was safe. On the surface, the right knee of Rontanen began to ache. Three hours later, Kai Kankanen emerged from the entrance of the cave to the pond. He aimed his light at the layer of ice above him and began to look for the dive hole. Kankanen found the hole, but it was covered by a roughly one centimeter layer of ice. He managed to break it, pushed his gear into the ice and clambered out of the water. There was no sign of anyone anywhere. It was half past one in the morning and dark. His dive lasted 11.5 hours. He walked up to the van, turned on the engine and switched the lights on. Patrick Ronquist and Vesa Rontanen reached the Jordbrew farm and contacted the Norwegian authorities. It was nearly two in the morning when they noticed the lights of the van. They ran up to the van through the snow. Kankanen was lying on the floor. He thought he was the only one who had made it out of the cave alive. The police launched an investigation into the incident. Gronquist, Rontanen, and Kankanen were interrogated, while Rontanen was still being treated in the recompression chamber in Bergen, Norway. Officials decided to leave the bodies in the cave, as it was too dangerous, imposing a diving ban and closing the area for visitors. But that was not the end that friends of Yari Huo Tarenin and Yari Usimaki wanted. It was springtime in Plura Dolin, but underground, it was the same as ever. Dark, narrow, bleak, and damp. A group of Finns gathered at the Stein Nugel Flagate Cave on 26 March. All three divers were certain from the beginning that they would come back for their friends. After Norwegian authorities had decided to leave the bodies in the cave, Gronquist had sent a text message to some of his friends, asking if they wanted to participate. Everyone replied yes. Kai Kankanen was similarly eager to return to Norway, although he had suffered from anxiety and had yet to dive after the accident. Montanen, due to decompression sickness, volunteered to assist. This major recovery operation had been kept secret from the authorities. Divers would enter the cave from both entrances and leave 26 bailout cylinders inside the cave. An underwater habitat would be established roughly one kilometer from the pond to allow divers to rest while performing their decompression stops if necessary. Ultimately, it was Gronquist and Sammy Pakarenin who retrieved the bodies. Both the bodies were in the same place and close by. The following morning, Sammy Pakarenin rang the authorities. Although the bodies were retrieved against official orders, the actions of the divers did not come under criticism. As they were carrying their gear out of the cave, roughly a dozen local residents came to help them. It became a joint operation. Finally, the dead got the honor they deserved, as their friends were not keen to leave them behind. The job was tough, but it had to be done. These divers relived the moment but managed to hold their nerves to get them back.